Okay, so um, morning again. Welcome, uh, everyone. And um, I hope uh, that our deep dive into SQL will be useful to you, that you will find it useful. Um, so as Stur said, we're going to be running many of the hands-on exercises on the Carolina supercomputer. This is a new um, system uh, sponsored um, by the UHPC joint undertaking. Um, you can read more um, about the, the, the setup of the system on its website. We will be using the GPU partition uh, mostly of this, this um, system. So it's important that you um, try to log in and if anything doesn't work that you report it to us or um, there's uh, Jakub in the um, call you can maybe send a message or uh, an email to, to him if you um, get in any trouble. Because uh, it's important that we try out these exercises that we prepared on the actual hardware, where um, SQL is, uh, is uh, one of the tools that one can use to, to port code to GPUs. So um, you see my screen here. On I'm sharing again the HackMD. Let me make uh, it a bit larger, the font. So I, I've summarized the instructions for, for working on Carolina um, with the materials for the workshop. As Tour said, these are online. Um, so now on the right hand side, you see my, my terminal. What I suggest that you do is you try to log into Carolina and if there's trouble, you report it. Uh, but if you manage to log in, you try uh, and clone um, the repository uh, for the works, what? <laughs> oh, sorry. I should not copy the dollar. So you try to clone the repository and then you will have this folder and all the code and all of the material is inside this content subfolder. So if I go inside content and then code, I see two folders, day one and day two, and uh, I've split um, the exercise into these two um, folders. Okay, so for today we will be working inside day one, and then uh, there's various subfolders for each of the various sections that we will be going through. Um, so when it comes to the software to load, um, there's modules for both um, HipSQL, which is the SQL compiler that we will be using uh, for the most recent release version, 0.9.2, and for CMake, which we use for building the code. So don't worry, you don't have to write any CMake code. There's CMake scripts already uh, as part uh, of the exercises. They're complete and uh, working. And here I have instructions on how to, to, um, to build. So you can refer to this document. This is at the top of the HackMD. Or there's um, um, a setup on Carolina section in the... Um, no, this doesn't work. On the, on the training page, um, which you can refer to at any moment. So I also put the instructions on how to get an interactive job um, on the system. Um, so Carolina uses PBS as a scheduler, not Slurm. So there are some differences if you're used uh, to using Slurm, but uh, what is important uh, for this workshop is to know how to get an interactive job. Uh, with this comment here that you can refer to later. I've limited the wall time to just one hour uh, in this case, but uh, if, you, if we ever need an interactive job during the workshop, it will be for a much shorter amount of time. So we have an allocation, uh, this DD2228, uh, but it's not an extremely large one, so please do not start running jobs that require a lot of resources because that would mean that uh, other people in the workshop will not be able to run anything and you will uh, most likely exhaust uh, the allocation that we have. Um, so most of the time uh, I suggest that one runs through the queue so that you um, uh, adapt uh, the submission script and submit with queues hub uh, to the queue to run your job. Um, okay, this said, uh, with the practicalities, uh, we can move uh, forward to actually starting uh, the first section of this workshop. So, um, as it shows in the schedule, today we will be going through um, this section, so a short introduction to SQL, uh, 
and then we'll talk about some of the uh, most fundamental concepts, mostly how to do data management and the concept of queues, common groups and um, kernels. So I will sub submit a job to, to a device. Um, tomorrow uh, we will talk uh, about actually writing uh, parallel kernels uh, with SQL. And we will end uh, the day tomorrow with porting and quite uh, generic app uh, that solves the heat equation. On day three, there's some, um, I would say, specialty topics we can we can call them. We will look a bit at profiling, how you would profile a SQL application, um, subgroups, and uh, the evaluation of trade-offs of the two different memory management models. So let's start um, with, with today's uh, first section. So what is SQL? Um, so uh, I guess most of you have come to this workshop because you're interested in, in, uh, in uh, programming uh, GPUs and the interest for programming GPUs is, is increasing uh, not only because um, they are basically the main uh, hardware workhorse for machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, but because many of the newest high performance computing systems that are coming up online uh, in Europe, but also anywhere else in the world, um, are increasingly powered by, by both, uh, there's not just CPUs, but there's also GPU partitions, and the GPU partitions usually uh, deliver most of the flops um, that are available in, in this system. This is the case, for example, um, with Carolina, but also with the Vega supercomputer, and especially with the Lumi supercomputer that is being built in Finland, which is the first pre-exascale system being installed uh, within Europe. Um, so one needs to take into account this fact when designing a new application or trying to optimize an existing application to use these new architectures that most of the computing power is not just coming from a better CPU that probably has um, higher frequency or higher core count. You also need to be able to use GPUs effectively um, to, to harness the computational power. So what happens though, and I think this is a problem that many of you have faced, is that with every new architecture that comes out, there's problems porting code to work uh, on that architecture. And this historically uh, has been brought about by the fact that each vendor kind of equips the new hardware with its own software stack. So you have low level programming languages, for example, CUDA or for NVIDIA hardware or HIP for AMD hardware, and these Frameworks are all quite similar to each other, but they differ in some, some mostly minor, but there is also major differences that make sure that developers need to stay current in both of them and try and kind of win these races basically in, in, impossible. You cannot, especially for small scientific softwares, um, it's usually very hard to make sure that uh, one code works on all possible architectures. So this has basically made programming of GPUs a very time-consuming and error-prone um, art, and most of the time it is scarcely portable because one needs to master low-level programming languages and it may take years to do so. Um, and the code base between a CPU, uh, what the CPU should do to solve the same problem in an efficient manner, manner and what the GPU should do to solve the same problem can diverge significantly. So the, the programming um, the way of programming these devices is different, and one often ends up with two different code bases, one that works on the GPU, one that works on the CPU, and they're very different, and that means that the maintenance burden is really high. So I have an example of this here. This is a very short example. So this is um, a single precision AX plus Y kernel, uh, usually called Saxby, and I have different examples here. So in CUDA, in HIP, and we can see what I said what I said above that CUDA and HIP are not that different. They basically look the same. Um, and the differences mainly come um, uh, in, in some of the most um, um, minor details that might be uh, very important for performance though. And then there's other um, frameworks like OpenMP or OpenECC, which also um, are uh, useful on, on, um, <clears throat> for programming on the GPU, especially OpenMP. Uh, it can target GPUs nowadays. And uh, that are still different from CUDA and HIP, but they're still low level enough that I would categorize them as low level programming languages. And this works through prag pragmas. 
So uh, we write the code and then add some uh, comments around it that describe to the compiler how uh, this calculation can be offloaded to a GPU. So a few things to notice about these examples. So in CUDA and HIP, we prescribe exactly how the computation should be split up into the very various computing units. So this is called uh, prescriptive parallelism. So we explicitly kind of manage how the thread, how the work maps to the threads. Um, OpenMP and OpenSC are slightly higher level because we don't uh, deal with these um, details uh, of the implementation, but let the runtime um, decide for us how to generate correct code that also splits the computation among the, the available threads. Um, so when one uses a low-level API like CUDA or HIP, it's inevitable that the code diverges between CPU and GPU because um, we need to think uh, differently about how the computation is split up. So we need to do this calculation of the thread index and the mapping of work threads and so on. Um, so since these are low level languages, you might not be able to write very expressive APIs. So this is a drawback, especially if you are used to working in a high level language like C++, for example, where there are many such abstractions that one can think uh, up and use to, to kind of make um, developers more productive. Um, so another drawback of using low-level APIs is that both the compiler and the language might be proprietary and vendor-specific, which means that you're basically just locked in into a specific vendor. If you just use, for example, CUDA, then you can use CUDA only on NVIDIA devices, and that might limit both what is called functional and performance portability, meaning that if you want to go to AMD, then you need to rewrite it using HIP or OpenMP. So the pragma-based schemes, so OpenMP and OpenSC, are standardized. Um, at, at least OpenMP is, is, is an international standard. Uh, but this means that, again, you're at the, at the mercy of the compiler implementers. Did they implement the standard correctly? Did they implement all of the standard? You can never know um, for sure. And it always, there's um, uh, some time, it takes some time for the vendors to implement the standards fully, even if the standard has been approved and, and um, uh, published. So I'm not saying that SQL will solve all your problems, but it's definitely a step um, in, in, in the right direction. And why do I say so? Because um, you have to evaluate all the trade-offs between performance, of course, portability, and productivity. And by productivity here, I mean programmer productivity, because if you, if you need to spend uh, years going from one programming model to the next, then you're probably wasting some of your time. And some um, software uh, cannot uh, afford to spend this much developer time on providing a port. Um, so why is SQL an improvement or a step in the right direction to improve on all of this performance, portability, and productivity trade-offs? Because it's a standard-based um, framework that is vendor agnostic. So what SQL does is provide um, domain-specific embedded language that is expressly designed for parallel programming, and not only for parallel programming on CPUs, but with heterogeneous architectures in mind from the start. So um, GPUs and even FPGAs are not um, an afterthought of the standard. They're baked in um, from the start. So when, when the Kronos group, which is the group that is steering the development of the SQL standard, sat down, they had um, the use of GPUs in mind. Um, so three main characteristics of SQL. First of all, it is a header-only library, meaning that you can download the headers and just compile them with any ESO C++17 compliant compiler, and you will get a functional code. It will probably not work on a GPU, and uh, that's why you will need a SQL compiler. I will give more details in a, in a little bit. So it does not require special compiler extensions. So this is the, the very important point. You don't need to have um, uh, some special language additions to use it uh, that are baked in into the compiler itself. It's a header library. So it is a single source style programming framework, meaning that both the host and the device code are in the same translation unit. There is no separate compilation between um, global kernels in, let's say, CUDA and HIP style, and um, code around the trans on the CPU and manages uh, the dispatch to the device. And it is, by default, asynchronous um, programming model, meaning that the 
as programmer, we describe, much as in OpenMP and OpenCC, how the parallel computation looks. Uh, and by that, I mean also memory allocation, data migrations, kernel launch, and so on. But the runtime uh, takes this information during compilation, creates a task graph, which orders the tasks based on, on the order in which they should run, and then decides when to launch them. Um, so these decisions are not, I mean, we can influence them. We will see tomorrow how that can be done. Um, but the, the runtime relieves us of a lot of low-level decisions. So why do we need a SQL compiler then, if this is just a header-only library and it's ESO C++ 17? That's because many of the concepts that are um, uh, within SQL, for, for example, queues and unified shared memory, buffers and accessors, they are, yes, C++ abstractions that can be implemented in, in a header-only library. But if we want to have performance, then we need an optimizing compiler that can understand how to map uh, these concepts to um, the, the, the assembly that is understood by the underlying hardware. So for example, on NVIDIA, there's the PTX, so parallel thread ex execution language, and an optimizing compiler will be able to translate uh, high-level SQL to uh, PTX so that it can run efficiently on, on, a, on an NVIDIA GPU. And the same uh, for HIP, um, for AMD devices with ROCAM, or for CPUs with OpenMP, and so on. Um, so there are many SQL implementations to choose from, so this is good news. It means that it's not just um, the one um, um, vendor that decided to implement this standard. There's many of them. And um, this, in a way, guarantees that this is not going to die um, anytime soon. Um, and in this figure, I have a little scheme of what implementations are available so far. The one we will be using today is HipSQL. So this is an open source. Uh, it's developed at the University of Heidelberg. And it can target basically all um, the, the platforms that are available um, um, today. So both NVIDIA GPUs, um, CPUs through OpenMP, AMD GPUs through ROCAM, and this level zero dashed line means uh, Intel uh, GPUs, which are not widely available yet, but hopefully will be in the future. And then we have Intel, who's also um, invest a lot of money on, on uh, pushing uh, SQL through what they call uh, Data Parallel, Parallel C++ Compiler. Uh, Codeplay was one of the first to, to provide uh, an implementation of a SQL compiler. Uh, it's called Compute CPP. And then we have some um, specialty implementation like Tricycle that um, targets FPGAs and NeoSQL, which um, targets um, these vector engines. Um, and of course, there might be more uh, in the future, and one hopes that there would be uh, more so that um, there's, there's wider availability of, of SQL compilers and SQL implementations. Okay, after this quite long introduction, we can start looking at the first code example. Um, so I will leave both windows open, both my uh, browser and the terminal. Um, okay, so... Uh, in the terminal? No, uh, well, actually, rather in the material. Okay, yeah. Let's see how that looks. Better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's first load the ipsql module, which I think I forgot to do before. Module list, yes. And then module load, cmake. Uh, I'm loading a specific version just to be sure that there is um, no conflict of, of uh, modules. So if I open this hello CPP, this is already a complete. Um, maybe it's better to a full screen so that the lines are not. So this is already a complete um, code example. Um, the things to notice here, so when we, we start working with SQL, I said it's a header-only library, so the first thing one needs to do in its, the C++ code is include the SQL.hpp header, okay? So we have this include SQL slash SQL.hpp, and then all of the SQL um, abstractions are behind uh, a namespace, so using namespace SQL, 
is something that you would do as I do in this case in a source file, in a .cpp file. Um, if you write code in a header file, this is not good practice because then it would mean that everything that includes the header file will, will uh, make the namespace available. There can be namespace clashes, but in this case it's safe because I'm just compiling the one source, uh, source file. So here what I'm doing is declaring one uh, string of uh, gibberish. Okay, so this is some random characters. Um, and I get its size. And then, so this is standard C++. And then let's start putting some uh, uh, SQL uh, specifics. So we declare a queue. So the queue is the main mechanism by which we interact with the device. Okay, so one queue maps to one device, which means that if we want to perform work on a device, we need to send it in through a queue. Okay, so all of our SQL programs today and tomorrow and the, uh, the day after will start uh, basically by first declaring a queue. Um, so once we have a queue at hand, so this is done uh, with this constructor, no need to send in any parameters. So by default, it will find uh, like a device that, that works for us. And we can make sure of what device we're running on if we call the get device function and try to get, for example, the name. Okay. So the name is an implementation uh, detail in this case. So uh, if we're running on the GPUs on Carolina, it will be NVIDIA A100, but it can be some other uh, vendor specific name. So once we have a queue and we know which device we're running, what we do in this example is to do an allocation of um, an array of car. Uh, and the allocation is done using this malloc underscore shared. Uh, function. So this works basically just like malloc would, but instead of just taking the size, um, and now the size is a uh, number of elements, it's not the size in bytes, um, it also takes a second parameter, which is the queue. So the malloc shared function is one of the unified shared memory uh, allocation functions that uh, creates uh, an allocation on the device for us, that's why we need to pass the queue argument. And since it's shared, we will see later on today, it means that this data is free to move between the device and the host, and the migration of the data is um, managed by the runtime for us. So this is quite convenient because we, don't, we have the level of control, if we wish, to say allocate on the host and then copy to the device, but we can also let the runtime decide for us when it is time to move the data between the host and the device. So once we have this array, this array is now empty. So we copy inside the result array, the data that is in the secret string, and we use the standard mem copy function in the C++ standard. And now we do some work. So to do some work, we, get, we take the queue, and then we can use the parallel for method on the queue. So parallel for takes two arguments. The first argument is so-called uh, it's so-called range. So it describes how um, basically how big um, the computation should be. So how many threads should be spawned, if you wish. And in this case, we're working on a one-dimensional array. So the range is one-dimensional, and that's the reason for the argument, the template argument one here. And the range uh, is one-dimensional, one-dimensional, and it should span the size of the car uh, array that we allocated before. And then the second argument is a lambda function. So lambda functions uh, appear everywhere in SQL. So we will see a lot of lambda functions in this, in this workshop um, because that's essentially the, the way you describe work um, for parallel execution in SQL. So this second argument is a function uh, object that takes, um, so captures, um, all uh, the the <clears throat> excuse me, all the arguments that have been defined beforehand by value. So the result array is available inside without explicitly passing it in, and then it takes an identifier um, of dimension one, which basically maps to one element in the range that we've declared as first argument. So this TID we can treat as a thread index, as we would in uh, in uh, CUDA, for example. Um, and then inside um, the kernel, we do some computation. In this case, we take the result array and we take the element at the given thread index and um, 
subtract one from it. Okay, so this is seems silly, but uh, we'll see what happens when we execute it. And one key point is that I mentioned before is that SQL is asynchronous. So whenever we launch um, work on the queue, if we need the results back on the host, we need to wait for 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 this parallel work to be done. And that's why we put the dot wait um, uh, call here. So the chain of calls is q dot parallel for arguments to parallel for dot wait. So that we're sure that the execution is complete whenever we get out of that function call so that we can do this uh, printing standard C out of the result and be sure that the results have been actually, the results have actually been computed. So finally, as in every program, uh, you should free um, whatever memory you have allocated from, from the heap. And this is done with free result. And again, the allocation was on a specific queue. So we need to pass the queue a second argument. So after we've discussed uh, this program at length, let's see what happens if I uh, build it. Yes, this is complaining, configuring complete because hip Seagull wants to know which device it should um, create source, um, sorry, binary code for. So how is that done? Uh, that's in the instructions uh, that are on the web page. So you pass this hip SQL target uh, option um, to CMake. In this case, I'm on the login node, so I'll just try to run uh, through the OpenMP backend, so not in the GPU. So now the, the um, configuration is done. I can type make. <clears throat> and let's see what the load does. Um, okay. Some warnings to, to CUDA, but we're not using CUDA at the moment, so we can um, forget about it. So it tells me running on hip SQL OpenMP host device. And that was the print statement at the very beginning that we put there, where we tried to probe the queue for what device it was uh, going to target. So these lines here. And then the final uh, print is was that standard C out result. And we see that basically uh, the gibberish string, if we um, basically shift every character by one backwards, it prints this hello world um, string. So this is it for this short tutorial. What one could try as well, and um, I think it's already time for the first break, so we will not try it now, is to try to submit this compilation to, to um, one of the GPU nodes and, and see what happens in the printout. The only thing that should change is that instead of saying heap SQL host uh, OpenMP, uh, OpenMP host device, um, the computation will go on the GPU. Okay, so, but we will see the exact same result because things uh, work in exactly the same way uh, when, when we're using SQL. So we are describing how the computation should look uh, but uh, not the finer details of how the, the runtime should uh, go through the computation. Okay, so the summary here is that you should think of SQL as, as a way of uh, moving forward from schemes that force you to think about GPUs and CPUs in, in, um, with a different uh, mindset and something that not only unifies the way you submit work for parallel execution to one of these devices, but uh, also unifies the way you write code because it's a single source um, framework uh, that, that can basically help you also organize and minimize code divergence. Um, so you need to keep in mind that uh, SQL is an asynchronous uh, programming model. So you might need to um, basically put some weight clauses um, here and there. Um, so this is, of course, uh, something tricky. But we will see later where, where um, uh, how, how <clears throat> to basically understand when that's necessary. And finally, uh, with SQL, you can avoid vendor lock-in because there is many compilers, optimizing SQL compilers, 
that implement the same standard. They might have some extensions, but you can avoid working with the extensions and just working with the, with the approved international standard. Okay, so I think we're ready for the next section. Just to say it again, all the material is, is, is online, so it, at any point um, you can go back and, and look at the, the exercises we were running and try to run them um, locally or um, again on Carolina during this week. Um, so this material is not going anywhere, we're not taking it uh, offline once the, the workshop is done. So there were some questions in the HackMD, but uh, I've tried to compile targeting the CUDA GPU, why didn't it work? Um, so as, as the, the people replying uh, wrote, the login node does not have GPUs. So if you want to try that out, either submit a job through the queue with a submission script uh, or uh, ask for an interactive job, okay? Um, so yeah, um, apologies for that, I should have pointed it out earlier again. Um, speaking of how do I make sure that I run on the device I want, um, uh, this next section is going to try and answer some of the questions you might have or some of the questions you might not have right now, but you will have probably later on, when you start working with SQL um, uh, more. Um, so what we did before is was declaring a queue and then just submitting work to it. And in our case, the work was just simple parallel four. Um, so, and the parallel four was accepting a range of execution and a lambda function, so a kernel um, to execute. And in, in the SQL standard, these, these kernels are called uh, actions. So you will hear me refer to um, the lambda functions alternatively and equivalently as kernels or actions. Um, so another way of doing this is to declare a queue and then call so-called uh, submit uh, method, queue.submit. Um, and within the submit, you also declare a range of execution and, and um, um, a kernel that specifies uh, some work uh, to be done. So the runtime schedules the actions for us and the actions can be either parallel work execution or copies um, of data between host and device. Um, <clears throat> what's important is that the runtime sees this submission and then prepares a schedule of the actions, so the order in which they should be run. In case they need to be run in order, they can also be run in parallel. We don't have to specify these details. The runtime will do this for us. And this execution then is done asynchronously. So that if you need the results of a submission of work to a queue, then you need to wait for it. So we will look um, at, at how to define queues, command groups, and kernels in the next section. But what I would like to stress in this section is how do we make sure that the queue does submit work to a given device, okay? Because um, in this workshop, we don't really care uh, too much about what device does the work for us, but in actual code, you want to make sure that you run, for example, on a GPU. And this is not really common nowadays that the single node has different kinds of GPUs, um, but it might be that, that a single node might have multiple GPUs from multiple vendors, and then you want to make sure that maybe certain sections of the code just work um, on an NVIDIA GPU on the node and not an AMD GPU. So we need to be able to uh, have this level of control. So, uh, and this goes uh, through the queue object, um, because um, a queue maps um, to one device and one device only. So. This is something that uh, I would like to stress and I would like you to remember that when you declare a queue, it maps to the, that one device and that cannot be swapped during execution, okay? So there are mainly five strategies uh, to run our device code. So when we write our code as we did before, we can just declare a queue and then compile and then the runtime decides where that work ends up. So we run somewhere. Um, as long as we don't care um, where this thing runs, this is a valid strategy. This is probably a strategy that is not um, very good in the long term, but that's definitely something that works. So you would call the default queue constructor just with queue um, and name of the queue, semicolon, and that creates a queue that will map to any device that is available. And that is what we did before. Um, we just declared the queue and it ended up uh, using OpenMP.
Um, so if you want more control, then we need to look a little bit at how sound the queue constructors are, are, are defined. So especially um, this one, which takes two arguments. The first argument is so-called uh, selector, so which selects um, basically which device to use. Is it the host or is it the GPU, is it an FPGA and so on. And the second argument, which is um, not mandatory because it has uh, a default empty list, it's, it's, it's a property list. So you can further refine the device that you want to run onto by specifying certain properties that it might have. For example, I want an NVIDIA GPU with more than a certain amount of memory, so to speak. So the selector um, is the abstraction that lets us steer how the queue um, maps to the device. So if we want to run on the host, which in, uh, in, in, uh, in the SQL standards is called the host device, um, we use um, the host selector um, object. So instead of just using the default constructor, we pass this host selector uh, as first argument in the constructor we just saw above. And uh, the host device uh, basically um, is an abstraction over um, the available CPU. So to, to, to the standard, the CPU looks like an independent device in, in the architecture of the node. Um, and is made such that any code that you submit to the queue will still be able to run whether or not you really have um, a GPU or an FPGA or not. So the host selector is not something that um, it's probably generally useful because it's an abstraction on top of uh, any hardware that is available, but it's useful in three scenarios, especially. So you're trying to develop heterogeneous code, so code that should run eventually on a GPU, but you're running on a machine that doesn't have the GPU uh, itself. So for example, you're trying to develop code on your laptop um, that should target, for example, running on Carolina. Um, and, and you can use the host selector to mimic the fact that you have a GPU, even though the hardware is not really there. Uh, you want to debug device code, but you don't have access to, to, to device debugger. You only have access to a CPU, uh, so CPU tooling. That's when host selector is, is also useful. And then three, if you want to write safe code, meaning code that will not just crash if it doesn't find a device, you can have it as a fallback option. And this guarantees functional portability, meaning that um, people that use your code will be able to compile and run anywhere, even though uh, if you fall back to the host selector, the performance might be really bad. You can also decide to go on a specific class of devices. Um, and in this case, uh, again, the standard defines four selectors, so default, it's an implementation defined default device. And this in the heap sql compiler can be changed when you configure with that heap sql targets argument to CMIC. Then there is the CPU selector, which expressly maps to the CPU device. So for us, it would be using OpenMP as parallelization strategy. Then we have the GPU selector, and this targets a GPU on the node. So in our case, when running uh, on a, a node of Carolina, that would be one of the NVIDIA A100 GPUs that are available. And finally, so-called accelerator selector, um, which is a generic accelerator device. So it might be a GPU or an FPGA. Um, so and then you can write your own selector, meaning that if you have specific requirements of the device that you would like to run on, um, you can derive um, um, a class, so let's call it special device selector, um, inheriting from the, um, for example, device selector class, and then implement methods that select your device based on certain um, metrics, so-called score. So the first thing now I would like to do is uh, basically to try and um, use these heap sql targets that we tried, some of you tried to use before, but on uh, a node on Carolina. Um, so this is an exercise that we can do in breakout rooms. And what I would like to do is go in this 01 hello selectors um, folder. 
and try to compile with uh, and try to configure the code um, with with um, different heap sql targets and and see what happens so basically we're trying to uh, understand how this selector strategy um, behaves when um, working with ipsql so that that you have an idea of what the compiler can bring uh, to the table when you're um, writing selectors so let's see so we also have uh, other exercises so let's say that you open breakout rooms for 10 minutes now so that we get a bit acquainted uh, with sending jobs to the queue made um, a mistake in the description of the exercise this was supposed to um, be structured differently than what I said so I apologize for that so what we will do now is I will try to go through and explain the code that is in the solution folder and try to run it myself uh, on an interactive node um, to show more or less what should have happened so to get the interactive node, we use this qsub uh, minus a blah blah uh, command. Um, this is in the hackmd. So you can copy paste it. Okay. It always takes a little bit. Yes, and now I'm on a GPU node. So if I do NVIDIA SMI, it will show me the eight uh, NVIDIA 100 cards that are on uh, on the nodes. Okay. So now I go back to my um, workshop folder, code day one, and then zero one and low selectors and to the solution. Okay. So this allows CPP does the same that it was doing before. The only thing that I added at the bottom was to uh, basically play around with these selectors that we uh, discussed before. So host selector, default selector, CPU selector, and GPU selector. And then print some info using this get info um, method there. So the goal of the exercise was not stated really well, but I wanted you to get acquainted to submitting this thing as a job uh, through the queue on Carolina and see what output you would get out. So the main thing here is that um, through, uh, I should load the modules, of course, if SQL, module load, and then module load, cmake 3.20.1, and I want the one based on GC10 tool, okay? So the main point I was saying, um, and one thing that is nice with SQL is that you can um, steer for what the full device uh, you are going to compile by this ipsql target. So if I now try, instead of compiling for the OpenMP target, for CUDA, um, I would get, okay, make some warnings. I have my executable here, and then dot slash hello. So the, the hello word thingy uh, that we were printing before, this the code in the string, now it says it's running on one of these NVIDIA 100 uh, GPUs, okay? Um, so now instead of going on the OpenMP uh, based device on the CPU, we're actually running on the GPU, so the queue maps there. And then the printout from the different selectors. So the host selector, as we said, it's an abstraction that will try to run GPU or device code on the, the host device, which is the CPU. So in this case, it's still OpenMP. The default selector, since we compiled for uh, CUDA, still goes towards the NVIDIA A100 um, GPU on the node. The CPU selector, again, it's the OpenMP host device. And GPU selector is, again, NVIDIA, because that's specific to the GPU. Now, if I try, just for the sake of it, to um, do OpenMP, I make, again, we would get a different output when it comes to what the default selector would be. So if I do dot slash hello, 
Now the default selector points to the OpenMP host device, not to the GPU. And CPU and GPU selector, again, each one goes to the respective devices, so OpenMP and NVIDIA 100. Um, so this is how far you can get with the default selector, so the ones that are defined in the standard. If one needs to do more, to be more specific to what one wants to use, then you need to write your own selector. And that's basically, uh, since I'm done here, I will release the interactive job and I'll go back to this other screen. Let me put it in presentation mode. Okay. Um, so I was saying one would need to write their own selector and this is done by inheritance, uh, mostly. Uh, so this is something that is here in the material and there's also an exercise uh, in folder 02 that will guide you through how to do it. Um, so this is something that is, uh, I would think, it's for more advanced usage of SQL. So it's part of the material, but we will not go through the exercise um, right now in the interest of time, because I think it's more interesting to look at how at the next section uh, as to basically how we define queues and command groups and kernels. So uh, we will go on a break now for 10 minutes. And when we come back, we will um, look at some more meaty uh, stuff. So how uh, we submit work um, to a queue and what kind of work we can submit and so on. Okay. So if you have questions, I will be looking at the ACMD during the break. So just shoot uh, any questions you might have and I'll see you after the break. Okay, and uh, yeah, we're back uh, again. So I saw there were some questions that came deep, but uh, people have been, other helpers have been faster than me to answer. So I guess they're all answered already. Um, so I updated the, the submission script at the top so that now there's a limited wall time so the jobs would uh, hopefully go through faster and it shows like a full example of how to use CMake for each of the exercises. The thing that you need to remember to change is this thing between uh, um, angle brackets, so the executable name, because every exercise is a different name. So we saw that at the beginning it was hello <clears throat> and the next ones will have different names. So just remember to change this if you want the executable to run uh, correctly. Okay. And um, when we submit through the queue, we just set hip sequel targets to CUDA SM80. No, we, we won't try to look at the difference between execution with uh, NVIDIA and with uh, OpenMP, okay? Okay, then I just add this. Thanks. Like this. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's it's time <laughs> to move forward with the, the next section. So as promised, uh, we will look at how to organize um, parallel work, work and parallel work in a SQL application. So in the objectives of these sections are to learn about what queues are. We already know that there are the abstraction that SQL offers to, to interact with the device, uh, so to speak, and to uh, direct what happens on the device. Um, for the moment, we've seen just one simple way of, of working with the queue, so by calling the parallel for method on the queue uh, to submit work. We will learn about common groups, what common groups are, because it's possible to add more than just a parallel uh, for within a queue submission. There are some limits, but um, uh, we'll see what those limits are. It's important to know them. Um, and and most of all, um, I want you to, like the take home message from this section, especially, but from the workshop is that uh, one needs to think about um, kernels as units of parallelism. So a kernel should be structured in a way um, that maps uh, quite well between the data that you have and the work you would do or you would want to do on it. 
um, assume that you have a parallel um, <clears throat> hardware at hand. So the Q object is the abstraction in the SQL standard that connects the host program to a single device. Um, so again, I stress that one Q is one device in SQL, and once the mapping between Q and device has happened in the code, you cannot take the same Q and remap it to another device, okay? So this is something that the standard does not describe how to do. So there might be extensions to do so in other compilers. I don't think there are, but they might be. But then it's not um, standard SQL anymore. Um, so the Q is kind of the central um, um, abstractions in the whole standard. So all device code, all code that should be executed on a parallel device, is submitted to the queue in so-called actions. As I said, I might use the word actions and kernels interchangeably in, in the, um, during the workshop. So the runtime um, knows the schedules of these actions, uh, how they should be executed in what order, because that's its job, <laughs> to prepare the schedule. It's, so -called, uh, it's the so-called task graph that we will discuss later tomorrow and executes the actions asynchronously. So it knows the constraints between the actions, what should execute before and what should execute after, what can be executed in parallel, and what should wait for what, and, and, and basically schedule such that these things can, can be executed um, without uh, having to wait uh, on each other, without serializing the program. Um, so the runtime then keeps track of all these prerequisites between the actions, all the dependencies, um, when, when preparing the schedule. And the most important um, um, dependency between actions usually is the availability of data, data. So if data needs to be copied between host and device, or, or and so on. Um, so the queue, which which basically gives us the abstraction towards achieving this kind of um, um, asynchronous um, runtime um, is, is, we can say it's the essence of, of working with SQL. So we need to know how to work with that. So our program um, within the SQL runtime is seen, as I said, as a task graph. So there's nodes and edges in this graph. So each node is an action to be performed and advised. So, and an action can be either the invocation of a kernel, so doing some work on available data, or explicit data movement, so getting the data from one part uh, of the machine to another. And the edges are the lines that connect these nodes. So what node depend on which other node? So which node is waiting for data to be moved before starting uh, parallel work in the kernel? So the task, um, graph is, is directed, so there's the direction of execution, the passing of time, so we start at one point and we end at another, and it also is acyclic, because we cannot have a node depend on itself, that would basically not work, the scheduler wouldn't know how, um, how, how to organize work if there, was, if there were any self-connecting nodes. So since we execute everything, or we write code so that everything is submitted to a queue, the runtime uh, has perfect knowledge of what's going on uh, in the code and can thus generate the task graph for us. So we don't need to uh, care about this aspect, at least not initially. We can, of course, influence the, the, the formation of the task graph, which we will see tomorrow. And once the schedule is known, um, we can, when we run the program, we can execute it according to the schedule that the compiler generated for us. So we basically traverse the task graph um, in a manner that is judged to be the most efficient uh, by the runtime itself. So as I said, there are two kinds of actions that can be part of the task graph. So these are nodes in the graph. So execution of device code. Um, so, event, so these are all pieces of code actions that are nodes in the graph and that eventually will end up running on the code, uh, on the device, okay? Running code on the device with data that is uh, available there. Um, so when we submit these kind of actions, we need to specify the range of execution and what code needs to be uh, executed within that range of execution. So we need to specify a kernel. Um, 
So there you can either invoke these methods that submit code for execution device as arguments, um, as methods on the queue class directly, or on what is called the handler class. So this is the handler is a way of grouping multiple commands in what we will see shortly is a common group handler. Uh, so there are three such methods for submitting code uh, for execution in the device. <clears throat> so the single task, so this is when we want to execute one single task as the name says, uh, and this will run one single instance of the kernel code. So this is basically uh, if you want to execute something that is guaranteed to be serial, you would use single task. And you only submit one uh, of these, um, meaning that you don't spawn multiple threads to run this single task. And we will see an example of this at the exercise at the end. Then we have parallel four, which is um, what we saw at the beginning in the decoding of the gibberish string in the hello world example. So this launches a kernel with a given work size, the range of execution that we um, glimpse uh, before. Uh, and this launches a kernel in what is called single instruction multiple threads fashion, SIMT, which is, uh, if you're familiar with CUDA, the way you are supposed to write CUDA kernels, where you map um, <clears throat> the available group of threads to uh, the data uh, that you want to, to process. And then the final one is so-called parallel four work group. Uh, so this launches again a parallel kernel in so-called hier hierarchical parallelism fashion. So this way of launching a parallel group, a parallel work, we will not uh, discuss it in this workshop because it's still it's it's in the standard, but uh, the implementations in the compilers are not um, very optimized. So it's still something that is rather in flux. And um, for example, in IPSICO, there's a different implementation that is not fully part of the standard. So it's available only through extensions. So this is something that we will not uh, look into that much. Um, but I just mentioned it here for completeness. So we will basically just look at parallel four uh, in our discussion of how to, to uh, express parallelism with SQL. And then the other kind of actions that you can have are explicit memory operations. Uh, that means copies between host and device and between device and host. Uh, again, we can call uh, these, these memory operations either directly as methods on the queue class or as methods on the handler class. Uh, and there are again three of these such kinds of operations. So there is a copy that copies the data. There is update host. Uh, whose scope is basically to trigger uh, a device to host copy to update um, basically data that is um, present both on the host and the device with the value that is available in the device. And then fill, if you want to fill an array um, with, with, um, with a given value, okay? Um, so we have at this point, I've talked a lot uh, so far, um, so we have um, kind of um, a high level overview of all the abstractions that SQL gives the programmer in order to express parallel work. Um, but how do we actually write the arguments to these single task and parallel for functions? We've seen at the beginning that you would pass one argument that is the range of execution, uh, which in uh, CUDA would map more or less to the number of threads that you should spawn uh, to, to execute that kernel. And then the second argument is the kernel itself. So what should be done for what one single thread that's been spawned should do on the given data. So we saw the um, lambda expression way of um, writing a kernel. So this is what we will use um, in, the, in the rest of the workshop because it's very compact and it doesn't need, we don't need to write that much code everywhere. We can just write it on the spot. Of course, in some cases, if the kernels become pretty long, uh, you might prefer the second option, which is uh, through function objects. So let's have a quick look at this. These are, so Lambda functions were introduced in C++ 11. Now they've become fairly um, well known and they, they 
um, have become even more powerful than when they were first introduced in C++ 11. So a lambda expression is a, a, the, is a so-called anonymous function, which you can declare in place um, instead of giving it a name and declaring it maybe in a header file and in a separate uh, source file. And they are very concise, uh, especially because you don't need to pass arguments in directly. Uh, since you can use so-called capture syntax. So what we were discussing before, that this square bracket equals means that everything that is in the um, enclosing scope of the lambda will be available within the lambda itself. So in this case, this data ACC array that I'm using here inside the body of the lambda, I didn't pass it in as an argument, but it was available in the outer scope. So if I capture it by value, then I can use it inside the lambda. And these lambda functions then take one argument, which is the identifier for um, the, the thread of execution. Okay, So here id1 means that this index comes from a one-dimensional execution range. If I were working with, with a two-dimensional execution range, the argument would be an id2. Three-dimensional, it would be id3. So uh, this kernel does something really simple. So it takes uh, my array of data at the given index and then augments the value by one. So plus one written as a lambda function. But we can also use a function object. So a function object encapsulates the function called within a class. Okay. So instead of writing simply a function that is called plus one, we write a class that uh, would, sorry, that would keep as a private member the data that we would like to work on. So this data ACC underscore, uh, which we pass in in the constructor, and then overloads the function call operator. So operator um, um, parentheses uh, to accept an ID one um, object, and then uh, does the same as we were doing in the Lambda function. So basically uh, augments um, by one, the value um, <clears throat> in the array at the given index. So you see that the two do exactly the same thing. Um, while in the function object case, we need to explicit, explicitly pass in this, this um, data ACC array through the constructor. In the Lambda function, we uh, do it implicitly by, by uh, capture list, but what they achieve is the same. So the difference is that, okay, the function object is slightly more verbose, and that's why I prefer to use um, kernels when writing SQL code than what you will see in the rest of the workshop. So technically, there are no reasons to prefer one approach over the other, except conciseness. So the lambda function approach is definitely um, less verbose. So it boils down to personal preference, uh, but there are three caveats you should keep in mind. There are some things you cannot do in your kernels. So um, some things you cannot do and some things you must do. So you must have void as return type. You see, this uh, overload of function call operator returns void. And the same for the lambda function, it returns void. So you cannot return non-void uh, uh, data types from your kernel function. This is similar to what you might know from, from uh, <clears throat> writing CUDA code where global functions that are executed on the device um, are all uh, returning void. You cannot use uh, a runtime type identification, so basically um, uh, dynamic cast um, in C++ cannot be used in kernel code, and in, in general I would say it's probably not a, a great idea in general C++ code to rely on RTTI. And you cannot allocate dynamic, uh, dynamically allocate memory within the kernel. And these are uh, all limitations that you also have when programming uh, CUDA or HIP. So they will be familiar to you. So queues again. Uh, I will. You will hear me talk a lot <laughs> about queues. So again, stressing that one queue maps to the one device. And the mapping happens upon constructions and it cannot be changed subsequently. I'm just saying it again and again because um, it's important. It's a very important point. So you cannot use the single queue object to manage more than one device. So because otherwise the runtime would not 
know how to map um, to which device to map work that you submit to the queue. Is it to device one or device two? Um, are there dependencies between the two? How do I resolve the dependencies? So this would just make uh, the, 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 the task graph generation ambiguous, so it's uh, forbidden. Um, and similarly, you cannot use a single queue object to spread work to multiple devices. So these might appear as limitations in a way, but you can declare as many queues as you want. So if you have, for example, on the Carolina node, you have eight uh, A100 GPUs, you can declare eight different queues that map to each of the different devices, and then make sure that you can use all eight of the devices on the node as appropriately as you see um, fit. Um, one other thing that you can do is you can create multiple queues to the same device. So if you want to submit uh, different sections of work always to the same device, but you don't want to use the same queue, you can, you can do that. So um, the relation between queues and devices is many to one. So you can have many queues to the one device, but not one queue to many devices. Um, as I mentioned before, and what we saw in the initial example um, for the hello world, um, when you have a queue object, you can already submit work to it by using parallel for or single task. And parallel for gets um, a range object as first argument and um, um, an action. So in this case, a lambda function to describe what works to be done there, so the kernel. So next uh, up are command groups. So of course in C++, uh, there's always multiple ways to do things. And it's not always obvious which one is the best way to do things. And SQL is not exception to this, that there's multiple ways to achieve the same um, uh, result. Some are more verbose than others. Um, and common groups kind of fall into this, this group. But of course, there are reasons why you want to use command groups. So now I'm, it's, I'm only partly joking about the added complexity. So a command group handler gives you more control over how you submit code to, for execution on a device to the queue. So submission is more verbose because um, you're not just calling parallel for with the range and the kernel, you call the queue and then the submit method, and then there's a lambda that takes a command group handler, and within this lambda, you would uh, call the parallel for now as a method on the command group handler. Um, so this is more general for uh, two reasons. First of all, um, the code inside uh, this, this, this Lambda that knows about the command group handler uh, can contain host code. So you can set up dependencies explicitly within um, the command group handler right here. Uh, so in this case, um, since this is host code, this is executed immediately, and this is not asynchronous. So when we set up, for example, an accessor to a given buffer, and we will talk about accessor soon, this code is executed immediately. And then uh, on top of um, host code that sets up dependencies, you can submit exactly one action for execution on the device, and this one is executed asynchronously. So you take a common group handler, this CGH object, and then call parallel for, again as before, with a range and a kernel function, and this code will be executed um, asynchronous, asynchronously, as if you were calling q.parallel for. Yeah, so these are the three things that I want to talk about. So the queues, the kernels, and the, the command group handlers. And these are the three ingredients that we will use um, basically uh, in the rest of the workshop to, to, to work with SQL. So now uh, I need to look at the schedule a little bit. So we do have an exercise at this point. So this exercise will not try to um, run parallel work at the moment. Um, shows basically how to use single task. Okay, so sometimes it's useful if you want to uh, print some stuff for debugging um, to make sure that there's only one thread um, 
that executes the printing so that you don't get confusing and garbled messages. So this is um, what is shown in this exercise. So if we go to this 04 single task folder, um, we can, I, I can do that myself. So day one, then 04 single task. Um, wait, what did I do? Yeah. Um, so this is a scaffold code. It's not complete um, because you need to completely complete it on your own. And there's various prompts. This is various fix me prompts that, that will tell you what to do. Um, so first of all, in this code, you would like to create a queue. And we want to submit work. As you see, I'm calling queue.submit. So this means that I want to use a command group handler. And within this uh, command group handler, I submit um, some host code for execution. So I create a SQL stream. And in the instructions to the exercise, you will see uh, what arguments um, uh, should be given to the stream constructors. And then I submit a single task. And this single task is uh, basically to print something to the stream. Um, so single task, um, yeah. So we can go into breakout rooms, let's say 10 minutes again, so we have enough time to kind of get acquainted. The time in the breakout rooms is really short. So I'm not sure if everyone managed to get through the, 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 the full exercise. As I was saying, one of the other breakout rooms, you can always just take a peek into the solution folder and look at how um, one possible working solution uh, looks like and try to execute that instead of um, stressing over finishing uh, your own exercise because that's that's equally valid for learning just just to look at these simple examples um, at first so the um, the exercise here was attempting to do two things one show you how to create a stream so this is an, an output stream so um, um, it works like a C++ stream only it's aware of the fact that it's um, going to be executed possibly on a device so it there's different ways of allocating the memory where you should push the characters to print and so on. So this SQL stream is aware of that. And then when you call a single task, so the syntax looks similar to calling a parallel for because uh, you send in, in this case, a Lambda function. The difference is that since a single task will be executed by one thread and one thread only, there's no need to pass in the range, execution range information. So that argument is not accepted in the argument list of the single task. So we just pass the lambda. And as usual, the lambda um, captures by value, so with this equal here. And we pass no arguments in because we don't need the thread information at all. And then within this single task, our goal was to print a simple string to the output stream. And that's uh, what we're doing. So you take the stream, which was captured by value, so it's available within the body of the Lambda and then the redirection operators, the message and, and the end line um, um, character. So if we execute this, um, we will see this little string being printed out. So not tremendously useful, but is something that might be useful in some cases to know how to spawn a single task um, and use a SQL uh, stream. So after talking uh, about devices and a bit about device discovery and learning almost everything there is to know about queues, it's time to look at memory management. Um, so here's a figure that one of our colleagues here at the NCCS um, prepared that shows uh, schematically how uh, CPU and GPUs are made. And um, the thing that uh, I would like the take home message from this, and you might know this already, is that the two devices are, are organized, um, are built and organized differently. So the main difference is that um, they have separate um, memory hierarchies, meaning that whenever we want to transfer data from one device to the other, 
we have to go through a slow um, PCI Express bus. Of course, in newer GPUs mm, uh, and newer CPU architectures might remove partially or entirely this limitation, but these architectures are not yet available. So at least for now, we still need to kind of grapple with the fact that data movements between CPU and GPU <clears throat> can cost us um, performance uh, because they are uh, slower than moving data, for example, be between the L2 and the L1 cache on a CPU, for example. Um, so one of the main difficulties um, of programming for GPU devices is indeed the fact that one needs to take into account um, uh, the fact that memory is um, a resource that might be available in large quantities, but in um, a not that high uh, speed as, um, for example, the speed of the, of the chip itself. Um, so any kind of computation that, that we might want to execute um, does require uh, memory because there's some input coming in, some output being produced, and we need to shuffle this output to other functions and so on. So transfer data is something that happens in any application and um, something that impacts performance and that we need to take care of as programmers if we want to optimize our code. So with SQL, uh, we have um, two ways of uh, performing this kind of data movement. So, so uh, either explicitly or implicitly. And the standard in itself doesn't mandate that we choose one approach over the other. Um, so we will see in the last section on the third day um, what might be the benefits and trade-offs of each of these approaches. But so far, let's just say that we have both options available for us and uh, the standard doesn't uh, tell us which one is better because, of course, it depends on our own domain, our own application. So if we use an implicit strategy, we are fully delegating the problem of data movement to the runtime itself. So what we were saying before, with nodes and edges in the task graph, we can think of movements of data as the edges that connect different nodes, okay? Because one node might be, might be an action that requires data from the execution of a previous action, then the two are connected with an edge that the runtime will realize um, at, um, as, as um, basically uh, uh, issuing a data movement uh, routine call. Um, so the fact that we can um, delegate this responsibility to, to the runtime is something that we, we, we can really benefit from because it not only avoids us from thinking explicitly ourselves about doing these low-level operations, but uh, it also reduces quite significantly the, the, the um, opportunity to introduce bugs related to data movement. So maybe we forget to allocate or uh, deallocate twice, so double free and so on. So if we use an explicit strategy, on the other hand, and thus this is the first trade-off that one needs to take um, keep in mind. So if we choose to do everything explicitly by hand, we have full control, but then uh, we might get back into a situation where we need to write a lot of boilerplate and some of this boilerplate might be buggy. So there are errors, of course, whenever humans are involved. So what are the memory management uh, abstractions in SQL? There are three of them for um, in the context of, of, of um, um, let's say scientific high performance computing, the first two of them are the most relevant. So unified shared memory. So this is a pointer based approach and it's, it looks and feels very familiar to anyone that's programmed in C and C++ already. And it's similar to CUDA and HIP. So if you have experience with these low level languages, you might feel right at home by using USM. So USM pointers on the host are also valid pointers on the device, okay? So this is the difference with classic, so to speak, pointers in CUDA and HIP, where if you declare a pointer to memory on the device, then it's only valid on the device, not on the host, unless you use the universal um, memory um, allocations uh, that are available in, in um, later versions of CUDA and HIP. Uh, for USM to work, we need to work 
work on a device that supports what is so-called unified virtual address space. So the, the addressing space on CPU and GPU is, is kind of unified so that this pointer arithmetic um, is valid. The next abstraction is so-called buffer and accessor API, um, which uses um, high-level um, C++ objects. So a buffer is a handle, a view, to uh, allocated memory that can be one, two, or three dimensional. Okay, so we have a bunch of data. Um, it can be a raw C++ pointer or a STD vector, and then uh, we wrap it into a buffer. So the buffer doesn't own the memory itself. It only provides a view into the data uh, managed by this other object um, with the structure um, of one, two, or three D array. Okay. So it only needs to know where the memory uh, location is. So it's essentially what is called a view. Uh, you might be already familiar with this if you work, for example, with Cocos, or if you're following the newest C++ standards and addition um, that are coming in the, in the past few years, and uh, where it can be accessed. So is it accessible on the only on the host, only on the device, or on both? So the buffer itself, I'll Stress, again, does not own the memory. We're not allocating a buffer. We're uh, wrapping already allocated memory into a buffer. And um, <clears throat> we don't work on a buffer directly as a consequence of this, but we rather use so-called accessors. So an accessor, um, we will see, is constructed by giving it um, a buffer object and a common group handler, so that it knows where and how it can access the given buffer um, when working on a device. So this is um, a really kind of C++ way of working with high-level abstraction. If you are familiar with so-called resource acquisition is initialization approach, RAI, this is how things um, are organized also in SQL. This is kind of one of the fundamental patterns in modern C++ development. And it's similar in a way to what the standard template library does. For example, when you declare a vector, it's a handle to, to memory that you can interact with through higher level abstraction. And whenever the vector goes out of scope, you don't need to deallocate the memory by hand, but the destructor of the object will take care of that for you. And then the third abstraction for memory management is so-called images. So the API is similar to that of buffer types. So you also have accessor to images, but they're thought to be used when you're doing computer graphics, so to handle image processing. So we're not that interested in image processing in this workshop, so we will not talk about images, and instead focus on USM and buffer and accessors. So this episode is all about buffer and accessors, and the next one, before the end of the day, will be about unified shared memory. And then at the end of tomorrow, after we've seen more about expressing parallelism, a bit about profiling, we will kind of gather our ideas and try to look at uh, benefits and, um, and um, um, of each of the approaches and when you should use one or the other. Okay, so buffers. I've said that buffers are views into memory that has already been allocated somehow. So it's a data abstraction that the runtime uses to represent any object um, in the code. So the view, into the memory can be one, two, or three dimensional. So let's assume, for example, that you have a matrix, you would use a two dimensional buffer that is constrained to the dimensions of the matrix. So number of rows times number of columns. Um, so when you use buffers, you need to keep in mind, of course, that they do not own their memory. They're just a view into already allocated memory. And this has two consequences. We do not allocate buffers, okay? we initialize them from already allocated memory. So only, as I write here, only objects that are trivially copyable can be represented in a buffer, uh, because that means uh, that the runtime is able to take a byte by byte um, copy without having to invoke a complicated uh, or a um, custom copy constructor. So the buffers, as consequence of the fact that they are, that they are only views into memory, do not provide an API to access the data inside, okay? Because that would mean that they should provide an API also to modify the data, but since they do not own it, they cannot uh, allow um, you to, to modify it. Otherwise, it would uh, basically break the synchronization between 
the memory allocated possibly by another object and the view uh, within the buffer. So there is no subscript operators uh, to access this data and there are no getters and setters. We have to use accessors uh, to do that. Uh, so how do we construct the buffer? As I said, uh, we need to specify their size, so one, two, or three-dimensional, and the extends in um, all dimensions, and we do that by using range objects and the memory um, that that uh, they should uh, kind of point to. So the buffer class, as uh, is written here, is templated over the type of the underlying memory, so floating point, single precision, double precision, integers, and the dimensionality, which can be 1, 2, or 3D. So the size is specified with a range object, um, and it's, it's, it's not um, by accident that the range objects are also used as first argument when we launch Parallel 4. So they are used to express the, 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 the range of execution, and they also constrain how <clears throat> a buffer is dimensioned. Um, so there are a few buffer constructors. Here I'm just showing a few of them. Uh, so we can construct a buffer just using a range and a set of properties. Uh, if we use this form, then it is not pointing to any memory as of yet. Um, so this might look useless, but we will see um, that it uh, can actually um, be helpful um, in some cases when we don't want to, to, to trigger um, too many host to device copies. Um, we can set the data at construction directly by passing a host pointer together with a range and the list of properties, or we can use uh, smart uh, pointers in the, in the C++ standard library, like we can use a share pointer uh, to set the host data pointer together with the range, or we can use a pair of iterators, so the start and the end of um, a given iterable object, for example a vector. Um, so you could create a std vector and then use v.begin, v.end um, as the first two arguments of the buffer, and you could uh, initialize a buffer pointing to offering a view to the memory uh, within this vector. So one thing that one should keep in mind is that the destructors of the buffer, so the stuff that cleans up once the object goes out of scope, uh, are blocking, meaning that um, if they go out of scope, um, everything um, before moving on the execution of code that comes next, uh, the runtime will stop and wait for the destructor to, to, to do its thing, to clean up. Um, so if you define SQL parallel work within a new scope, so if you open um, a new scope with uh, curly braces, before uh, getting out of this scope, if there's any buffers that need to be destructed, then this will be a blocking call, meaning that we don't have to wait on the queue explicitly, because this is done implicitly by the memory management uh, infrastructure itself. So one thing that you should be warned about, if, if we are initializing a buffer with a host pointer, uh, the runtime has no way of kind of certifying that um, you are not kind of sneaking in and changing the pointer independently from the buffer. So this is still something that you as developer should take care of, meaning that if you are initializing a view into memory, uh, you are not changing that memory under the um, the rug of this of, of this view, because otherwise the buffer will not be valid anymore. The runtime cannot check for it. The compiler cannot issue a warning or an error for it. So you are setting yourself up for some nasty bug. Um, so buffers are one part of the strategy for implicit memory management. The second part is accessors, okay? So how do we actually manipulate data once we're wrapped it in a buffer? Um, so the buffer object just tells the run runtime how the data is laid out, but the accessor object is the one that actually tells the runtime how you read from it and how you write to it. Um, and, and, and not just to the abstract view of it, how you actually manage the memory that the buffer offers a view into. So this information 
is is of course crucial to 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 know how to read from and write to for the runtime to correctly schedule the tasks and how to order their execution because it needs to know for example when memory that is on the host should be copied to the device and how we're going to read into that memory and and write to it so when you define the accessor you are basically defining the, the data dependencies. Um, so the accessor itself, in a way, you can think of them as kind of drawing the edges between nodes in the task graph. So the accessor are templated over five parameters now. So of course the type and dimension. So if it's a double precision floating point number of a three dimensional buffer, you need to give the information. The so-called access mode. So how do we intend to access the data in the buffer? Are we just going to write to it, uh, just read from it, or doing both things? And this can help uh, the runtime optimize uh, the way you access the data. So it's important to keep in mind that you can set the access mode. Then the access target, so this specifies um, what memory are we going to access and where do we intend to access it. So the default is so-called global memory, but we have an option to use local memory as well. These are so-called local accessors, and we will have a look at them tomorrow in one of the exercises. And then the so-called placeholder status. Um, this is um, something that we will not show how to use, but um, there are details um, in the standard on, on what this exactly means. So accessors are created within a common group. And that is needed because uh, the accessor constructor does need to know about the, the common group. Okay, because that gives information which device are we going to access the memory. Sorry. So the minimal example of using a buffer um, and an accessor associated to it is we create the buffer outside um, the, the submission to the queue. In this case, I call this buffer A, and I initialize it with the one-dimensional range of 42 elements. Okay, so this is not pointing to any memory so far. And then within the, the queue.submit, um, I use the usual boilerplate, where I have a lambda that accepts a handler object. And then I declare an accessor, A, A so accessor to A, uh, with first argument the buffer, and second argument the common group handler. So here you can notice that I'm not specifying um, any template parameters, and this is because I'm using this C++17 feature called CTAD, um, template argument deduction, class template argument deduction, it stands for, where basically the compiler can understand uh, what the template arguments are from the arguments that we pass to the constructor itself. So this is really useful to avoid um, um, type definitions that span uh, many, many characters. So we use it in full uh, with SQL uh, to, to avoid typing too much. Um, so the accessor by default is in read-write mode and we target global memory. Okay, it's in read-write mode because um, the, the, the buffer was not declared as const so the runtime, without further instructions, cannot know if we're just going to read from it or write into it. So it just assumes that we want to do both things. And we didn't declare as to target local memory, so we just are going to do global memory. Um, so to combine this thing of having access modes um, and um, targets, um, SQL provides so-called access tags, which uh, give you the two things together. So if we want to target global memory, so the default access target in, uh, for example, read mode, we can use read only as the tag value. Okay. So this avoids having to give too many template arguments uh, again and help us uh, kind of um, write very compact code. So as an example of this, uh, again, we have our buffer to a range of 42 elements, and then we declare yet another accessor to it. Uh, so we pass A, the buffer, common group, handler, and then we said that we're going to be write only. So we're just going to write to the buffer in global memory. And no init 
Knowing it is a property that tells the runtime that whatever was in the buffer before we started accessing it, we don't care. So if you overwrite it, um, it's fine. Uh, so this is yet another hint at, at optimizing data movements and the way the, the buffer gets initialized. So if we know that we don't care about what was there before, it might be useful to use knowing it. So the final kind of accessor that is there and that we, we look at in this section is so-called host accessor. So this is used to read the data on the host from a buffer that was previously accessed on the device only. So where is, where is this useful? This is useful to trigger copies of um, data that is on the device back to the host once we're done um, with, with, um, with the kernel. So an example would be as follows. So we declare a range without mapping it to any data yet. Then we create an accessor. Again, this is global memory on the, the selected device, um, read and write. Uh, by the way, we, we <clears throat> initialized it. Then uh, we fill the buffer. So this is a simple parallel for that puts the number 42 in all of the elements, uh, 42 elements of the buffer. And now this buffer has been allocated for us and filled on the device, but we want to use it on the host. So what we do outside of the queue, we create a host accessor, we call it result and initialize it again with the same um, buffer A that is mentioned here at the top. What this does is basically trigger a copy of the data back to the host so that um, we can basically run this loop and check that actually all the elements in, in, in the, the array are equal to the number 42. Um, so, Again, the host accessor, since it might trigger copies, uh, is something that helps the runtime um, generate edges between nodes and schedule the execution of these nodes based on the dependencies. So all of this without ever to have to write a mem copy from host to device, device to host, or having to uh, call a malloc or a free um, everything was done for us by the runtime. So the runtime knows how to do the allocations, when to do the allocations, and when to trigger data movements, so memory copies. So this is an extremely useful API. It can um, fix a lot of things for us. Um, so it's quite helpful to know how to use it. And we have an exercise here, um, which we can move into uh, breakout rooms to, to work through. So I would say we do 15 minutes now. Yep. Yep. And the point of this exercise is to basically implement the AX plus Y kernel that we saw at the very beginning, written in um, CUDA, HIP, OpenMP, and so on, uh, using SQL. So as usual, there's a scaffold with fix me prompts that you can go through. And, uh, and try to, to work out. And you can always look at the solution in the solution subfolder if you don't manage, so. And then uh, there's um, three kinds. So malloc underscore device, malloc underscore host, and malloc underscore shared. So what are the differences between these three? Um, there's this little table here that should help you kind of summarize this information. So if we do a device allocation, so if we call malloc device, what we get is, a pointer uh, that resides in the memory space of the device. Um, it is a valid pointer both on the host and the device, but it's not accessible on the host. So if we try to um, uh, use the, the square brackets to access one of its elements, that wouldn't work. It is accessible on the device, obviously, and uh, the SQL runtime does not uh, provide automatic migration of the pointer to memory between host and the device. Okay, so this is um, basically what you would get if you did a CUDA or HIP uh, malloc. Um, then there's malloc host. This um, allocates um, memory that is accessible on the host and on the device. It resides in the host memory space and does not automatically migrate between host and device. What does this mean? It means that uh, 
if we try to access a pointer that was allocated with malloc host on the device, uh, the runtime will still be able um, um, <clears throat> to access it, but instead of copying it to the device, we'll, we'll, we'll access it remotely. So this means that this has high, like huge impact on performance if you try to um, access a host um, USM pointer on the device many times. Okay, it might be useful uh, to to do so in some limited cases, uh, but it's not in general something that I would recommend um, to do. You would probably be better off um, um, doing um, um, malloc device if you need to access this kind of data more often on the device. And then the final uh, kind is shared. So you would call this uh, with malloc underscore shared to get a pointer. Um, so this is in a shared memory space. What does that mean? It means that the pointer is accessible both on the host and the device, uh, but the runtime can guarantee that there can be automatic migration of the data if you access it um, from the host or the device, okay? So that there is always a copy on, on the, the, the native memory spaces. So to perform a USM allocation, there's two APIs that one can use. So the C-like and the C++-like API. So what do I mean by this? So in the C-like API, you still call malloc device host or shared, um, um, but um, you don't pass type information directly to the function. So you ask for a given size of an allocation and this size is passed in number of bytes. So for example, if you want to allocate 10 double uh, precision numbers, num bytes would be 10 times size of um, double, okay? So this is familiar, um, for example, from, from any time you've used um, malloc uh, directly. So where you pass the number of bytes and not just the number of elements. Then the C++-like API is instead typed meaning that um, you have to explicitly pass the type uh, as a template parameter, uh, but then you only need to pass uh, the number of elements that you want to allocate. So the multiplication by size of the type is performed um, for you implicitly. All of these function, uh, functions sorry, um, not only take the size of the allocation, but also the queue on which the allocation should be performed. Yeah and uh, a set of properties. We will not uh, go into this, uh, uh, the property list right now. Uh, it's important, again, to remark that you need to tell the runtime that these allocations happen on a queue, because again, if you want to allocate on a device, we need to know which queue maps to which device to make sure that the allocation is successful and does what, what we think it should do. And then finally, there's the third option uh, using the USM allocator uh, class. Um, so this, this can help you kind of build up um, higher level um, abstractions or this USM malloc and free API. And um, the exercise for this section has a bonus where you can kind of play around with the, using uh, the USM allocator. Um, so you can look at the solution for that bonus exercise if you're curious how, how that would work. So whenever you allocate memory from the heap using malloc, you need to call free afterwards. Um, and um, at variance with, with the C-like uh, uh, version of things, you still need to pass the queue there because again, also free needs to be aware of which queue, um, in which queue the memory was allocated into. So now we know how to get the memory through USM, but how do we kind of manage it? Okay, what what can we do with this with these pointers in in a unified shared memory? Um, so two functions um, are available to kind of fill this memory that we've reclaimed. So fill and memset. Um, memset is is should be um, familiar uh, for 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 people that have worked with the C or even C++ uh, to set all the bytes in the given location to a given value. Um, and fill does the same, but it's not limited to just setting um, an integer. So it is more flexible. Of course, if you want to fill um, these, these, these 
data pointers with more complicated data that is obtained with more complicated uh, routines, of course, you should use a data parallel loop, okay? So you can, um, again, q.submit using USM pointers to, to do this um, filling of data. Okay, now, the interesting bit, however, is how data movement happens. And that's because we've seen how that happens with the buffer and accessors, and that's mm, fully implicit. Um, simply by using the accessors to the given buffer that points to the data, and then the runtime knows how to reconstruct the chain of events that leads to that action being legal and uh, actually being able to execute it. So in, in, in USM, given the fact that we have the three classes of allocations, host, device, or shared, uh, we have also options to choose between an explicit strategy and an implicit strategy. So with explicit, we call memcopy, uh, if we like the untyped C API, or copy, if we like the type C++ API. Uh, whenever we need to migrate between different backends, so if we need to go from host to device, or from device to host, we can call this function explicitly. But the thing that one needs to keep in mind is that these functions are available either on the queue or on the handler class. So everything happens in the context of a queue or of a command group. So these are scheduled as actions so that the runtime is aware of adding this stuff to the task graph as nodes and possibly adding edges for dependencies. And um, also copies are, um, are asynchronous because every work that we submit to a queue or a command group handler is scheduled to happen asynchronously. Um, so let's look at an example. Oops, sorry. Let's look at an example. So here we have a little vector of 256 elements. There is a queue, and we create a vector on the host as a std vector of doubles of that size, and then fill it with this std iota uh, function. Okay. Uh, then the next thing that we do is we declare uh, an x underscore d uh, pointer uh, to double. That, that reclaims uh, the same size of memory and, but on the queue that we created at the beginning. Um, now, what we want to do is copy the data that is on the host vector into the um, area of memory pointed to by this host, uh, sorry, device pointer. So we submit to the queue, queue.submit, with a handler, uh, CGH, and then within CGH we call mem copy, if we like the untyped C API. So we pass xd, um, the starting of the host, uh, the start address of the host uh, data, and then n times size of double. Or we can use the type API. In that case, we just call copy and just pass the number of elements in the array. Um, we can also just submit through the queue. We can just do queue.copy or queue.memcopy. And the copies are asynchronous, again, I cannot stress this enough. So if we need the, to like touch the data after, we should put a queue.wait to make sure that the data is available. So we can contra contrast this with CUDA, for example, where the first part where we declare the host array is the same. And then uh, we would do a CUDA malloc and then a CUDA mem copy, um, explicitly specifying uh, the direction host to device. So this is kind of similar, maybe a bit more verbose in SQL. Um, but there is another option. So the other option is to say that we would like the runtime to take care of these kind of migrations between host and device and device to host for us. Uh, this is possible, and it's possible if we um, use what we call shared allocations. Because shared allocations are really there to make sure that the runtime can decide on its own when to do this data movement. <clears throat> so in this example, um, um, we, um, I show two things. So the first thing is how to use this malloc host. So malloc host, if you remember, allocates memory on the host, so on the host memory space. Uh, but this is also accessible on the device. It just will go through the slow bus. It will not be copied, okay? Um, so we declare this and fill it with just some numbers inside. It's not important what we put into it. 
uh, and then we declare x underscore s, and this is a malloc shared object, okay? Then within the uh, a parallel four on, on a, a 1D range, uh, we can get the index using still um, the ID object, but then we need to index into it to get the actual um, integer that that uh, that is the value of the index itself. Um, and this is because we're using so-called simple memory or yeah, USM, so this doesn't have the ability as the accessor object to understand in which element of the array to index into without actually having the real number. Um, and inside here, what we do, we fill the XS um, array, so the shared memory allocation, with uh, the data that was in the host um, um, memory allocation. So what happens is in this kernel is that each and every one of the single elements of the X underscore H are copied when they're needed, uh, while the XS is copied, uh, is migrated from host to device before we enter into the parallel four. And this is done by the runtime for us. So here we use a common group handler, uh, but we could be a little bit less verbose by just saying uh, we can launch the parallel four directly on the queue. So this is I basically um, all there is uh, um, to know at a glance about unified shared memory, USM. And um, so the exercise for this uh, section is again trying to implement the AX plus Y kernel that we saw before, but now using USM, not buffers and accessors. So in a way that is somehow a bit lower level uh, than what SQL can offer, but it is as um, useful, as powerful as buffer and accessors. Um, so we do have 10 minutes before the end of the day for today. So I would say let's go to breakout rooms for 10 minutes and try to, to have a go at this exercise. Um, I'm sure you might have had a look at the proposed solution here. So it, it, it's, it's not that much different from um, what we did with buffer and accessors. It's definitely less verbose um, because we don't need all this um, ceremony <laughs> before uh, actually using the data uh, to declare a buffer into it and then an accessor. We just have a raw pointer and index it as we um, would um, normally. Um, so one thing that I want to uh, point your attention to was that here I'm using malloc host for both X and Y um, and then sending them into this AX uh, XP uh, function. So this is not wrong. Um, of course, I mean, the code works and um, you can see uh, once you compile and run it that checking results, it gives the correct results, but it might not be the most optimal thing to do because as we've, we've, we've said, the memory that's on like uh, reclaimed with these host allocations um, is not um, copied um, to the device um, as a whole, but uh, when we use it like this, we can probably see a slower migration of the memory over the bus. Um, so one thing to optimize would be either we can use shared memory allocations also for X and Y. Um, but in this simple example, probably we could even just say, okay, let's put this directly into device memory. And then what we only care about is to getting the Z results back on the host so that it maybe could be a shared allocation as we do in the function so that this memory migration happens automatically for us. So this is one way to possibly optimize this kernel. I saw that there was a question in the direction the hack can be, and I can elaborate later on this. Um, but yeah, so for today, that's it. Um, thanks everyone. And we'll see you tomorrow.